the way it was for me is that I thought I was living a normal life by uh, working every day and uh, providing for my family, which I thought. And, you know, as long as I was working every day, as far as I was concerned, that there must everything must be okay with me. When I was younger, I was, um, I guess you could say, a very shy person. And um, especially when it came to asking a girl for a dance or a date, you know, I always had that fear. And um, of course, when I picked up my first drink, and it was in uh, Hyannis, uh, up on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, I was around 16 years old. And basically after I picked up that first drink, it took away all that fear. It took away, I was no longer shy. I could ask the girl for a dance or a date. It was kind of like that icebreaker. You know, I could dance with somebody, I could ask them for a date. And then once I got through that, then it was okay. But it was always that one thing that would help me to get behind that, shall I say, you know, fear. Fear of uh, doing something like this, asking to go for a dance or a date. And even when I was much younger, um, it just seemed like there was a lot of, um, a lot of fear, you know, and, uh, and um, when I picked up alcohol, it seemed like the fear went away. On weekends, I would pick up my first drink and I would black out. And I saw my biggest problem was staying in, I had to stay away from that first drink. And as long as I did, I was okay, but as soon as I picked up that first drink, that drink picked up the next drink. And then that next drink just took me to places that I never knew what I said, what I did, and it went on for, for several years. And I lived in a dream world, and, and I could never understand why, uh, well I know now why, but uh, how you can live in that kind of a life and, and do the things that you do. and make a fool of yourselves, make a fool of your family, and then the next day beg for forgiveness, promise you'll never do it again, and four days later be back in the same place. Um, and that went on for several years. I went to a, to a meeting and uh, I remember this, these fellows taking me to a meeting and uh, when they brought me home uh, they asked me if they could pick me up the next night. And so I told him, I said, look, I agree. I have a problem with alcohol, but I can do it on my own. So what I did is I stopped drinking for six months. And so I figured, well, how could I have a problem with alcohol if I could stop for six months? So what I did after six months is, of course, I rewarded myself for being such a good boy because I didn't drink. And I drank. And that took me, took me back out for another six years. And uh, in those six years, um, I remember what those fellows told me, that if it hasn't happened yet to you, if you continue to drink, it will happen. You'll lose everything. And so I did. I lost everything, my marriage, uh, my family. I ended up in several institutions, uh, electroshock therapy. I used to go to 12-step meetings, but I couldn't really understand what people were saying because I was so into my own head. I could not get out of my own head. And um, I became desperate, very desperate. And uh, I loved the people in the rooms. I loved the people even in churches who were praying for me, but I couldn't seem to get out of my own self until in 1978, I went out to a meal with my cousin and this was after I had gotten out of a treatment center and I was actually living in my uncle's house in the basement. And I remember uh, we went out to this dinner and I convinced him that it was okay for me to drink again and to get some wine. Of course he said to me, Chris, you can't, you can't drink. You know, you just told me that you're an alcoholic. You know, but uh, I convinced him that I could have the first drink. And, um, of course, after that, um, he took me back home. 
I went into the basement of my uncle's house and that feeling came over me where the drink needed the next drink, the drug needed the next drug. I was also mixing the, mixing the drinking at that, that point with another drug uh, called per Percocet. So I left the house and I went up to Tolland into a club up there where I had met some people up there and I had told them about my problems with alcohol and that my marriage had ended and that it, I just couldn't seem to get out of my depression, you know, and, and all the hospitals I was in, nothing seemed to be working for me. And so I asked a, I asked a girl for a dance and I had a dance with her and then I went back to the bar and I asked someone else to dance and, uh, and they said uh, no. I remember going back to the bar. I remember looking up. I was in a half semi uh, dr drunken state. And I remember looking up in the bar and I remember seeing the brightest clouds and the bluest sky I had ever seen in my life. And a peace came over me that had never happened to be before in my life. There was no more depression. There was no more, uh, you know, fear. Everything had left me and the answer became very clear. I needed to end my life and I needed to, in, I needed to end it right away. So I had a plan and in my half drunken state, I planned on taking my car and bringing it up to one of the exits in Tallinn and going down a hill and smashing my car into the bridge. And for the first time in my life, I could not wait to kill myself. There was no more fear of death. And I remember just vaguely leaving the club, could not wait to get my car. I put my arm around a girl I had met earlier that night with her boyfriend. And that's all I saw was this boyfriend come flying over a crowd with his fist, hit me in my face, I fell into a crowd, someone stomped on me, and then several hours later I woke up in Rockville Hospital. And alcohol had never got me to that point where I knew then that there was no more recoveries left of me. So by the time uh, the turning point came and, and I started getting into the 12-step meetings and so forth, I was so confused because I could not stop my emotions from taking over. I, uh, I was emotionally so bankrupt or that my emotions were running me every second of every minute of every day. So I could not get a handle on just saying, okay, you're not going to be depressed or you're going to be able to get out of this. I felt like I was kind of almost like in a tomb where I knew people were on the outside of me, but it was almost kind of like a wall between myself and them. And it was like anxiety just kept building and building. Even though I wasn't drinking, I couldn't get out of that tomb. I couldn't get out from myself. And then things that would bother me in my relationship and my marriage, I couldn't let them go. It was almost like that mental part of the illness, even though for a long period of time I would not drink, I could not stop obsessing. I was obsessive. Those th thinking just kept becoming obsessive. So it just seemed almost like it was impossible for me to get out of it. And, and that, those feelings took me into uh, a lot of different um, treatment centers for, for the disease of alcoholism, um, psychiatric units, uh, where one time I was in a psychiatric unit and I remember seeing people uh, much older than myself getting electroshock therapy. And I remember seeing them when they came out of the therapy and I remember this little smiles on their faces. And I remember basically talking the psychiatrist into giving me electroshock therapy. And basically I would be willing to do anything to just get out of my misery. And I remember friends in the 12-step programs kept telling you, Chris, you're an alcoholic, don't do this. And I kept telling them, you know, that I know I'm an alcoholic, but I can't get out of that constant mental thinking. It just was not going away every second of every minute. So I convinced the psychiatrist to give me shock, electroshock therapy. And the only thing it ever did for me was to help me for like 24 hours, forget about what was bothering me. And then after that 24 hours, 
the same thoughts would come back in until the fifth one, the fifth shock therapy. And I was in Hartford at the uh, Hartford Hospital and I remembered that the fifth one that they gave me when I was coming out of it, uh, I had too much muscle relaxant so I couldn't breathe. And I remember my eyes were open, I remember not being able to breathe, and I remember nurses running around me, putting needles in me, and that was the last, that was the last uh, electroshock that I had. But the obsessions were still there. When the alcohol got me to the point where I could not wait for death, there was no more fear of suicide, there was no more fear, it got me to that point. And so I knew I didn't have any more recoveries left in me. And I remembered what those who talked told me in the various 12-step programs and the various churches I went to and, and everyone that I had heard this so many times. And they said, in the morning, ask God to help you make it through the day. And at night, you thank him. I don't care if it's the worst day of your life. If you're sober, you're a winner. I was in McCook Hospital, a place called CHAP back then. And I remember for the first time getting on my knees sincerely and asking God to help me. I had never been ser serious before. It was always for other people. I asked Jesus into my heart. I, I, asked, I asked him to intercede, to go to the Father on my behalf and to help me. I could not do it alone. And at night, I would thank him. And that was a big turning point for me. I continued to ask in the morning and thank at night and continued to ask in the morning and thank at night. And even though I was doing that, I was putting one foot in front of me. Um, and I still had a lot of this depression. I, but I, I, I knew that the Lord was helping me stay away from a drink or a drug. And it was almost two years after I started to ask and thank where a very good friend of mine in the 12-step 12, 12 program, uh, I went to see him and I told him, I said, I, I said, John, I think I'm here for the last time. I know that if I drink, I will end my life instantly. I don't know what to do. I've tried every treatment center. I've been to the meetings. I've been to the churches. I get on my knees in the morning. I ask him in the morning and I thank him. And I remember him telling me, he said, Chris, I think, I, I think you should go see this other alcoholic. He reminds me of you two years ago. And I said, John, I just told you, I, I'm going to end my life. How can I help someone else? And he said, go see him. And I did. I went to this guy's house, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. It was in Vernon. And I remember going to his house. And he had very little, he was almost naked. And I remember walking into this house with these people and he, had a, he was about 250 pounds and he had a chair in his hand. And I remember him running after his parents. And I remember being in this crisis and I did everything I could to help save the parents and the girlfriend from him. But it helped me forget about me. The greatest gift that God gave me was to help someone else, to help our brothers and sisters. And when I did that, I got a reprieve for myself. The greatest gift I ever had was to help our brothers and sisters. And a peace came over me, and I did everything I could to get him into treatment. And thank God, he got into treatment, and it was one of those things that I started getting really hooked on trying to help other people. You know, Ever since that, my friend John, my, my mentor, ever since he um, put me in touch with that second suffering alcoholic that day, even though I was in a terrible depression, um, it seems like the greatest gift I could ever have would be to be involved with other people in recovery and being available in any way I can uh, to, to, to help people, to get them into various 12-step meetings whenever I can, to get them into whatever churches I can get them into. I'm active every day on a daily basis with people. And when I get off track, it seems like God brings in somebody else and it gets me back to the basics. So whether it be in meetings, 
in churches and, 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 um, or just, just being out there having an opportunity to share um, is what I'm, I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, I'm trying to share my experience, strength, and hope. I've also been involved with the leatherback turtle, which has been a very important part of my own recovery for many, many years. Um, the picture behind me is of, of uh, one of the photographs taken in 1951, one of the dramatic photographs of the leatherback turtle. When I was very, very young, my father was on a tuna fishing boat off Montauk Point in Long Island, and this huge leatherback turtle unfortunately had been harpooned out there, and it was so large they couldn't get it on their boat, so they towed it into Waterford, Connecticut, and they then uh, put it on the back of a woodworking truck and they hauled it 60 miles inland into Ellington, Connecticut where they put this turtle uh, and hung it up on a tree there. I was four years old at the time and I remembered seeing the turtle. I remember touching the turtle. I can remember the smell of the turtle. I can remember seeing the dried blood from where they had harpooned the turtle. And so turtles had meant quite a bit, you know, for me as a child. And I even had a pet turtle back then too. I call Oscar. It was a little box turtle that I, <laughs> that I had. So, anyway, in my own recovery after I got sober, um, I stumbled into these old photographs of myself with this sea turtle. And um, my cousin Ron, who owned a printing company, gave me a job at his printing company. And one day I was riding by Yale University where. Um, this turtle had been donated, and I thought, well, maybe I can sell the Yale some printing. So I thought if I could get in the door and mention my father's turtle, maybe I could get in the back door and end up making a big sale. So I called Yale, and my whole thing backfired. The, uh, the guy that was in charge of the printing just told me, he says, look, why don't you go back in the museum, see your father's turtle? So it was almost he knew that I was, I was looking for a marketing ploy. So I went. I went back to the museum and I saw the turtle after close to probably 30 years and uh, I became fascinated with the species and uh, I started to try to find out who the top scientists in the world were working with leatherback turtles. And I had a friend that went to Washington DC on my behalf and he got the top, top scientists in the world. Uh, told me what their names were and I started to find out who they were and I started contacting them and wanted them to see these pictures uh, of this turtle my father was involved with in 1951. And um, as it turns out, but for the grace of God, I was able to get one of the top scientists in the world to meet with me at Yale. And I'll never forget that day back. This was back in 1981. This was a uh, three years after my last drink. And I remember this top scientist telling me that no one had ever tracked leatherback turtles before. And w could you imagine us going up in a helicopter and putting a rope around one and trying to learn where they travel in the ocean, learn their migrations? And it set up this, it was like a spiritual thing. I'll never forget coming back home from Yale that day. And uh, I was coming back from New Haven. I was coming, actually going by where the Rocky Hill uh, uh, State Park is in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, and I remember it was like a spiritual, it was one of those spiritual awakenings that came over me, is it? Maybe I'm the one that's going to help find out where these turtles are. Where do they travel? How far do they dive? Uh, to learn about their body temperatures, their migratory routes. And it became uh, a, a gift, a, a gift from on high. It was a gift from God, something to get, again, something for me to get my teeth into to share my experience and strength and hope with other alcoholics and do what I could, but also to help God's creatures and to help save them from extinction. It was almost like, why did this happen with my father? There's, there's got to be another reason uh, for me to learn. So we successfully tracked the first uh, leatherback turtle in history, and I saw my dream come true in 1981. And it was just miraculous. All the people that got involved with me all over the world in 1982, um, I became friendly with Paul Newman and his family, and his daughter Nell told me that plastics were killing turtles. So then I felt, you know, there's got to be a reason why I'm here, and the reason is to tell the world that 
Plastics are killing turtles. Leatherback turtles eat jellyfish. And when they see plastics, they eat the plastic and they die. So ever since then, since 82, I've been trying to get as many people involved in the dumping of, of uh, pollution, any kind of polluted uh, materials. So we've done several television spots. We've been involved with a lot of uh, international networks with the British Broadcasting. Uh, we've worked with National Geographic. Um, um, we've worked with um, uh, Animal Planet and several, several other, other people trying to get the word out on the dumping of plastics. And at the same time, the great gift is if it wasn't for God's grace and him allowing me to be here, I wouldn't be talking turtle. There would, there, I wouldn't be here. So I feel that we're here to just pass on that message in time. Whenever we're here, however long we're here, God has given us this opportunity to pass on a message of hope that all things are possible if we're sober, if we ask him into our heart, no matter what, and make sobriety our primary purpose in life. Primary. There's nothing more in this life more important to us than primary purpose. Our primary purpose in life is to stay sober. Because if we're sober, we are available to do whatever we have to do. Life is not easy. We're going to go through pain. We're going to lose people we love. Okay, but God is always there for us, and he will provide for us. I'm so happy I can just tell who's ever listening that if I can be alive here to tell you that you can make it. If I can be here, you can make it. I don't care how far down you've been, because every day for two years, I, 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 I just couldn't, couldn't function at all. We've been fortunate to be able to set up a trust called Become Part of the Solution, which we want to pass on to all the churches and any nonprofit groups throughout the world, that they can set up a BPS in their own community. And we have one here in Rockville, Connecticut. And we've now got our second group going in Nantucket where we have a person in recovery there that is kind of a point person for the community. And we went up and we spoke to all the churches and all the various nonprofit groups there. And we shared our experience, how you can set up a BPS in your community. And a year later, they called me and the, B and the, and the group was working. It's working. We need, to, we need to pass on a message to hope. There's people in denial. They don't realize what this disease is doing to them. You know, they may have a lot of money, they may have a lot of fame, okay, and they may be justifying their right to drink because they don't think they have a problem because they go to work every day or they make a lot of money and you know something, and their disease is keeping them in that point that keeps them in that. That's why they say alcoholism is a disease that tells us we don't have a disease. It's cunning, it's baffling, and it's powerful. I guess if I was to tell a kid, knowing where I am right now, what I would do is I would share with them that I've been halfway around the world, I've had so much fun, I've had so much gratitude, I've had an opportunity to help be a part of the solution with recovering people, as well as also helping these animals, helping them from extinction. You know, I've been, I've been with scientists, I've been in, in so many exciting situations you know, and, and just life is so good. I would tell them the good things that could happen if they put away the drink or the drug. Well, oh, that's a hard one. <laughs> I would like my legacy to be that if I can just touch or know that I had touched while I'm here some people and to just, you know, get them to pass on that message of hope that I feel I'm supposed to be passing on. I guess just passing it on to stay sober and that my legacy would be basically that no matter how far down you go you can make it with with God's help he's there for us I think that's the biggest message that I and the biggest legacy that I could ever pass on to love our brothers and sisters to not be judgmental to to uh, to know that all of us are created and we are created in the image of God and he wants us to clean up our act and uh, and take away these character defects. I would like, like people to know that, um, that, that, that he changed my life and that he can change yours. That would be the most important thing I think I could do in this time, you know, that 
we're passing through, material things are not the answer, fame is not the answer, nothing is more important in this life than our relationship with our Creator. And if I can just touch anyone to seek His face, one person helping them out of bondage, that to me is what I want to be remembered for. I guess my, my hope and my prayer would be that the powers to be um, really come up with a way of getting the whole world hooked, hooked on recovery, hooked on being a part of recovery, hooked on putting a face, putting a face in recovery, which is what I'm trying to do now, my small part. The more people who can put a face on recovery you know, has got to be the most important thing we can do. How can we give anyone hope? One of my places early on in recovery taught me one thing, and that I wasn't a bad person. I was a very, very sick, sick person. I had a lot of guilt. I hated myself. I didn't think I had deserved to live because I thought I was a very, very bad, bad person because of the things I had done. And I learned the concept of the disease of alcoholism. It's a disease, it's a mental, it's a vicious, vicious mental illness. We're not bad people, we're very, very sick people. And when I learned that, it helped me take away a lot of that guilt. I didn't purposely set up to hurt the people. I did so much damage to myself by blacking out for 15 years. A person that loves themselves doesn't black out for 15 years every time they drink. You know, I was a very sick person. There's a lot of people who are very sick. We're not bad people. We're sick people. And that's why we need to get into 12-step groups, into the churches. We need to seek God's face, you know? And I was grateful that I learned about that, so I didn't beat up on myself. I had to just keep believing what people used to say, that. Get on your knees in the morning, ask God, and thank Him at night, and no matter how far down you are, you will get better in spite of yourself. Miracles will happen. And as you know, they did. They did. They, incredible miracles happened. So, anyway, if anyone's out there, and you got those that mental part of it, and you can't get out of it, and you don't think there's any hope, believe me, there is hope. Just hang in there, keep praying, and people will come into your life that will help.